Hello everyone, my name is Russ Sorrells. I'm one of the team members here at CapEx Sales. Today I wanna to talk about pressure decay calibration. How do you calibrate a pressure decay uh, application. Now, I'm going to speak specifically about how our Cincinnati test systems instrumentation is calibrated, how a calibration works, and maybe some of the specifics as to why you would want to calibrate. So let's talk about pressure decay leak testing right quick. Cur pressure decay leak testing is a measure of pressure loss over time. So we pressurize a part and we measure pressure loss out of that part over a specific amount of time. So theoretically what happens is I've got my instrumentation and it's attached or connected to a part that is fixtured. We seal the part, we pressurize the part, and we are going to then isolate the part. Now what's that mean? That means that theoretically we could disconnect the air going into the instrument, but we've still got a closed circuit uh, from the instrument manifold to the part and that is what is included in our uh, closed circuit leak test. And we're gonna measure the pressure loss of that circuit over the course of a certain number of seconds or minutes depending on the application uh, in the specific leak rate that we're trying to uh, detect from a, a reject perspective. So that is how pressure decay works. We isolate a part, we measure pressure loss over time. The key is calibration. Calibration is critical if we're doing a pressure decay leak test with a leak standard. So if we're going to do that, which is the traditional uh, Cincinnati test systems, I-28s, the C-20s, the uh, black belts, all of those instruments would utilize this uh, type of technology if we have a pressure decay manifold inside the instrument. So we're gonna run two tests during calibration. The first test is on our known good part. So we're gonna identify a known good part. People ask me all the time, Russ, how do I get a non known good part? Well, the way that, you, that I have uh, done it in the past and encourage customers to do it is, is identify 20 to 30 parts that you think are good calibrate to one of those parts, and then test the rest of the parts. Find the part that is the most negative. And we're gonna talk about uh, a negative leak here in a minute, what that means, but you find the part that's the most negative and uh, test it again, make sure it's consistent, and then that would be a potential candidate for being your master part because that part, if it's negative, was actually better than the part that you originally calibrated the test to. So that's what that negative means. We're gonna show it graphically here in a minute, but as a rule, just wanted to explain uh, how you might be able to find a part to utilize for calibration. So this calibration is going to, again, it's gonna do two tests. The first test is on our known good part. So here's kinda of what it looks like. You pressurize the part, And over the course of time, that is a, a, a typical test curve. Maybe it's a little steep on the pressure loss, but you get the idea. So this is gonna be our fill time. So that is our fill timer. This is going to be our um, stab or stabilization timer. This is going to be our test time. Right here at the end, obviously, we're dumping all the pressure out of the part. So we run our first test, and it's going to measure the amount of pressure loss uh, from, from this point to here. So this, let's say it's uh, 0 0.05 PSI. So 0 0.05 PSI pressure loss uh, during this, let's say it was 10 seconds. All right. So over 10 seconds, we lost 0 0.05 PSI from our known good part. So to the instrument, to the leak test instrument, 0 0.05 PSI now becomes zero SCCM. So every part that you run after this calibration, if it leaks 0 0.05 PSI, it will display zero standard cubic centimeters per minute. So zero SCCM equals zero SCCM. So it equals zero SCCM. Now, 
it's going to relax. It's going to come back to a more normalized state, and then it's going to run the second test. The second test is when the instrument opens up the internal leak standard. So we're going to run two tests. The first test is on our known good part. Second test is on our known good part with the leak standard introduced. So ideally, we're going to have a greater pressure loss with the leak standard introduced than we lost by the part or with the part uh, itself. So this might be the curve, how it looks with the leak standard introduced. Again, same part. So the leak standard is going to have greater pressure loss. So that, that space there represents greater pressure loss. So let's say that equals 0.15, so 0.15 PSI over that 10 seconds versus 0 0.05 PSI over that 10 seconds. So what does that mean? Well, if the leak standard that we used was a five standard cubic centimeter per minute leak standard, 5 S CCM at, let's just say at 10 PSI. If we subtract these two, so this is the pressure loss of our known good part. Again, this is our pressure loss of our known good part with the leak standard introduced. If we subtract those two, we end up with 0.1 PSI. So to the instrument, 0.1 PSI now represents five standard cubic centimeters per minute, right? So 0.1 PSI equals five SCCM because the calibrated leak standard that we were using was five SCCM. So that is how the calibration works for pressure decay leak testing. Now, uh, with our instrumentation, we're going to give you uh, what's called a uh, cow factor or a, um, um, a ratio. And that ratio is going to be of this pressure loss versus this pressure loss. If the two are not tight, so let's say you introduce the leak standard and you have very little pressure loss. So that was your pressure loss. Well, you're going to have a lot of false negatives, right? Or false, you're going to, you're going to reject a lot of parts that uh, may well be fine. They may be good parts, but they're going to reject because we've got very, a very tight window that every part has to hit. That is not going to be fun. You're going to dislike that. You're going to call me up and say, Russ, this instrumentation sucks. This is awful. And the problem is that we weren't able to get a great enough discrepancy between a known good part and the known good part with the leak standard introduced. So there's one of two things that have to happen. We need to either increase our cycle time, and I'll show you in a minute how that will affect the overall test, or we need to change our reject criteria or look at the tooling or try to identify, you know, why is it uh, so inefficient or is this reject criteria even possible for the part that you're trying to test because unobtainium is not possible if it's not possible then we're going to be beating our head against the wall you're going to be frustrated uh, from day one of this leak test if it is uh, extremely difficult and again you got to you know stand on one foot and hold your mouth right in order for it to actually work no fun so what you can do if you increase your cycle time, we'll get this visual, is this is going to continue to increase. That's going to continue to go out. And so if we've added time here, let's say we added another 10 seconds, now, now our window has opened up. And so maybe that is enough to get us a sufficient calibration so that it's more repeatable and we're able to achieve that uh, you know 10% gauge R&R that your quality group is likely trying to achieve. So that is one way to improve your calibration is to increase your cycle time. Uh, again, sometimes you just have to work on your tooling to get your tooling functioning better so that there's not as much pressure loss uh, due to your tooling. Uh, but most often it's because we need more cycle time because every, we want to run it fast, 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 fast. 
Um, I always tell people it's like cutting your hair. Um, so when you get your hair cut, if you cut it all off, um, you got to wait till it grows back. Well, when you're setting up a pressure decay leak tester, I highly encourage customers to go with a very long cycle time, do a calibration, and then begin to back it down from there. It'll be it's way better than trying to sneak up on it from from below to come to it. Is go ahead and get there and then back it off to a point where you realize, okay, I can't go any faster than this. I can't reduce my cycle time without um, compromising the quality of the test that I'm trying to run. So this is how you calibrate. Uh, leak test instrumentation utilizing a known leak. Again, my name is Russ Sorrells. I appreciate the opportunity to share this content with you. Any questions at all, please just ask below. What questions are you uh, having with regards to leak testing? What struggles are you having? How can we help you uh, succeed? Uh, we at CapEx, we cover the Carolinas, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Uh, have some amazing team members throughout uh, the territory to, to support you. And we work with uh, Cincinnati Test Systems, which is the world's largest leak test company. Thanks. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye.